Uh, as we were kind of chatting here, well, um, I think we kind of disclosed that I, I work for Red Hat, so a local company. I'm, I'm in the sales group, so I travel quite a bit. I'm a sales engineer, so I am technical. I don't do any negotiation, any of that stuff, so I can talk, talk to you at Nazi about a lot of our technologies, but I really don't know too much about pricing and any of that other stuff. So. I'm supposed to be the good guy. Uh, but what I'm talking to you to today about is more kind of a personal hobby, which is photography blended with open source alternatives. I'm sure everybody's heard of Photoshop and Lightroom and a lot of these expensive tools that, you know, if you go to art school, you learn how to use that because that's what the art, that's pretty much what the industry uses, right? Um, but as of today, you know, there's a lot of great alternatives. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Digicam primarily. Somebody introduced me to one just the other day called uh, Dark Table. So there's, again, more alternatives, and some mimic Lightroom and Adobe, and other ones mimic other types of tools, and sometimes they're very inventive and create completely different ways of manipulating uh, digital photos. So let me switch to my slides. So the topic is digital asset management. Anybody watch uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty? Did anybody see that movie? He was a, a negative asset manager for Life Magazine. That was his, uh, his job title. And so as a negative asset manager, he's basically managing all the film that would come in from the various photographers and then cataloging them and indexing them and then sticking them into the warehouse. And then when they needed them for print, he was responsible for retrieving them and printing them and doing this whole workflow. So essentially, if you, if you had the opportunity to watch the movie, you kind of mimic what he's doing in traditional analog world with digital. So uh, kind of first off, first off the bat, right, again, I'm a Linux guy, but I'm also kind of passionate about my photography, so you know, thanks for the interest and your time. Um, I'm going to begin with like the Photography 101, so we're going to teach everybody about 30 minutes of what do you need to know about your camera and what is an aperture, what is an f-stop, and I'll show you why it's important. Um, brief definitions of what asset management and workflow are about, um, but then primarily we're gonna step through the process. So I've got live working examples, or slurp some files off the, the, the SD card. I was out for about an hour before I came here taking pictures underneath the other bridges. So we'll grab a couple of photos and, and kind of make them nice. Um, I can show you some of the batch processing capabilities with Digicam. So again, as I kind of describe what a photographer <coughs> does with his inventory, and like let's say he goes off and photographs a wedding, and he comes back, he's got a thousand pictures to deal with, but he needs to hand over something within 24 hours to make the client feel like they're you know, that they're engaged and have some some relationship with the photographer. So you can't sit there and click through every picture and, and analyze everything like you would want to. You've got to have a, a smooth, fast way to go through it first. And then you come back and get to the good stuff later. Um, OK. So a little bit of housekeeping. It's uh, my mustache shot from last November when I did this. This is the uh, November, no shave November thing. So from last year, I did the same thing. Um, I've been a Red Hat for nine plus years. And for 15 years before that, I worked at various different companies as a Unix system administrator. So I've always been a computer guy, I've always been dealing with uh, with computer systems, always on the Unix side, never Windows. I would tell you how to fix a single thing with a Windows machine. I have no idea. Um, been up in the member here for as we discovered, 16, closer to 16 years now, and I got my engineering degree in computer science. Basic disclaimer: you know, I do this because it's fun. I'm not here to teach you how to run a business and make money, and so you know, we're here to learn and share information. So don't go making me responsible for keeping your inventory of digital assets and everything, you know, just be smart. Okay, so here we have a, a cross-section of a traditional digital camera. I, I can't see the dot because I'm colorblind, which is another disclaimer. I'm a photographer that's colorblind, so a lot of times when I start editing photos and I get uncomfortable with how I'm bending and adjusting contrast and color, I just switch it to black and white mode, so a lot of, but, 40% of my stuff that I push out goes out black and white. Um, but, so basic design, the terminology, single lens reflex, basically means 
there's this mirror in here that flexes back and up and forward. So if you describe the light path, right, this is the lens, your camera, I'm taking a picture of something, the light that comes in through the lens gets manipulated because you're either zooming in, you're zooming out. Um, either way, the, the light's got to be, it's going through these lens elements. Here in the center, you've got this thing called the, the aperture. You'll see a, a cross section of some of these details here in just a minute. But the reason this exists like this is because before the SLR design, uh, some of you might remember other cameras would have two lenses in it. So you'd actually have two lenses. You look down the top or you're looking through the side through something called the range finder. And you get an approximation of what the light coming into the, to the primary lens that goes to the film, you get an approximation of what that looks like. And if you're doing landscape and your target's way out there, the approximation is good enough. But if I'm doing something up close or a portrait work, this distance can actually make a significant difference in something you know, in the image. So having something that gave you a true view of what's coming through the lens is what this design does. So as long as the mirror is down, so there's a mirror right here, the light path that comes into the lens hits the mirror, goes up in this thing up there called the pentaprism where it bounces around and then comes out the eyepiece. There's nothing digital about that piece of it. This is still a traditional single lens reflex camera. Your cameras from the 80s, 90s all Just, work this way. Excuse me. People in yeah. back, can you see better now? Yeah, that's a big improvement. Thank you. Okay. Lights out. Okay. So, but what happened when we went digital is we just replaced the carrier that was back here that had film with something that had a digital sensor on it. So in the early 90s, uh, what did I say here, 1991, uh, Kodak was like the first to develop a, a camera that could take the picture and analyze the picture and do something unique with it like on the spot. Um, there had been other work going on with digital uh, imaging you know, earlier on in 1969 some stuff. This is all from Wikipedia. Um, but generally speaking, let's move on to the simple hand drawing. So here's a light path kind of following my way in here. But as I mentioned, it goes through all these lens elements. And here's this thing called the aperture. Um, I'll come back, I'll come back to that in just a second. The aperture basically is like the first throttle that controls how much light is coming to, to the sensor in the back here. Um, so then it goes to the aperture, comes across, hits the mirror, bounces around in the pen prism, shows up here. And then when you click the button, Basically, in one instance, this, the mirror lifts up. You have something here called the shutter. The shutter goes slick, and then you get light that's exposed to the film or the sensor in the back end. And you know, before batteries and digital, all this stuff used to be spring-loaded. So you know, wind the camera, click, the whole process it was all mechanical. Uh, then batteries were introduced because you had things that were added to the cameras to do like light metering where you had light metering, people had little charts that said, oh, it's a sunny day, I'm using this kind of speed of film, I gotta be within this kind of range of settings to, to get it to work. Now everybody works with a light meter. Um, but for a while, light meters on the camera and everything was still spring-loaded and very mechanical, which is great for the photography purists that wanna go out there and say, oh, I can use my, you know, my camera out into the Siberian winter, which a lot of electronics tends to stop working. It's like super cold or super hot. Um, okay, any fundamental questions on what the SLR process is and why it is this way? Yes? Why the prism instead of just the mirror? I don't know. You have to invert the image. It has to, it has to, it's, it's got to scale the image, right? No, it's, not, it's upside down. It's like, when it gets to the film, it's upside down. It's upside down. down. So yeah, if you don't have the pencil prism, it needs the extra reflection. Otherwise, when you look at the viewfinder, it'll be upside down. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the designs with the uh, with the uh, charged couple devices, you can just if you're reading off the screen, I mean, you can look directly at it. But right, and so that's a, a lot of the from what I'm reading and from my experience with Sony, this is one of the, the areas where Sony is really pushing the envelope and getting to mirrorless SLR cameras. Right, so now this is this is actually introduces a tremendous problem for lens designers because when the light gets to the back of the lens now it's basically got to get all the way to the film without you know warping and, and other you know issues and if you have a wide angle lens having this real estate that you got to deal with really puts a lot of constraints on the lens if i can move the sensor 
right to the back of this thing, it really frees up the, the lens manufacturers to do a lot more incredible stuff, make, you know, make it lighter, make it easier. It changed the design. But this was not something people were willing to give up until a suitable alternative came around. Yeah, and so, of, yeah. uh, one of the big design issues uh, with the SLRs is the fact that you've got this mirror that you know, springs up with a spring and then crashes into what, whatever is above and, yeah. co and causes the, you know, the camera to shake at just the moment that, you, that, you know, that your focal plane shutter is, you know, is taking the exposure. Right. Did everybody understand what he was pointing out? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get to that in a minute as well. <coughs> so here you've got the sensor. We basically measure the sensor's sensitivity in something called the ISO. And if you were a film photographer, you'd buy film. I'm going to be outside at the beach. I should get a slow film, like one or 200. If I'm going to be taking pictures inside, I need a fast film, like 800 or 400. Um, and then you would adjust your other settings based on what you load the camera with. Other photographers, you know, with other camera devices, you could load your film into a cartridge, and then you could basically change the film with the cartridge in, in, you know, during the middle of the day. So I'm out shooting naked photography, I'm in the shade, I could use my cartridge with you know, faster film in it, and if I'm out shooting in the sun, I could change the cartridge. But traditional SLRs, you load in your little cartridge, you just load it, wind it a couple times, you're good to go. The camera's loaded for the next 24 to 36 shots, and then you're done. And you got to unload it with the next canister of film in it. Okay. The basic design, if you haven't familiarized yourself with this, is that there's three main categories when you take pictures, and there's, there, um, there's three main settings that you have to deal with, and they all deal with controlling light. The sensor is like a sponge, and you want to fill the sponge with enough material, with enough water or light, so that you can retrieve a nice image out of it. So. There's a basically, you know, if you look at your meter, there's a little arrow that says, I need more light, I need less light. But let's say the meter here is saying, for this particular picture that I want to take, um, ISO 400, the f-stop of 5.6, aperture of 5.6, and then the shutter speed of 1 15th of a second should give me the right kind of picture. But I know that, you know, one of the problems you mentioned was, you know, shakiness. If my hands aren't super steady, 1 15th, no matter what you do, it's going to be a, a picture with, with some shake in it. It's going to be blurry. Typically, handheld pictures, you got to be north of like 125. So, what you would do is like, well, I can load a faster film. I change my settings. So, if I'm going to pull this down and go this way to 125, well, then I can pick a faster ISO setting. And these, there's a relationship between all these steppings. So, if I change <coughs> one in one direction, I can change the other one in the opposite direction and get kind of a, a neutral effect out of it. So if I increase my shutter speed by two stops, I can increase, decrease the ISO by two stops. That kind of, that's the way this relationship works. So you've got these three things to pick from, and the net effect is either going to be more light or less light. Uh, now, this, this applies to a digital camera, right? Absolutely. Because I, with, with film camera, you know, the film is said to be fast or slow, depending on how quickly there's sort of a trade-off of resolution. Yep. But with a digital camera, you have a fixed sensor, and yet it still has a, a setting somehow for ISO. But how does that vary? I mean, the, the sensor is it, it has a very similar property in that the faster the ISO, and this is where a Sony versus a Nikon versus a Canon and their imaging technologies kind of leapfrog one another. But at like super high speeds, if you drop the ISO up to like 1600 or 3200, the image becomes, starts to become more green, just like oh, it did with film. Oh. So you do have trade-offs. Uh -huh. It's not like just a, oh, I'm always going to shoot at 32. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. yeah. So uh, do, you, do you know anything about what is the mechanism, I mean, the mechanism when, you do, when you're dealing with film for um, changing, changing film speed was, OK, this has a different chemical composition, and you physically swap one in. There must be some electronic mechanism that says the CCD will, you know, that will cause the CCD to become more or less sensitive to light. Yeah. So, so uh, do you have any idea what that is? So basically, the, it, any kind of counting error is proportional to the square root of the number of things you're trying to count. So basically, it's a CMOS chip now. So what you said earlier, the CCDs are not fast enough to do the live preview on the electronic viewfinder. The Sony's all have CMOS chips, which is basically the same kind of electronics that are operating most of the inside of your chips. But you can basically think about it as the amount of noise is proportional 
the fluctuations if you're trying to, let's say, you shoot a gray wall, right? Noise, if, if everything is actually even, the noise is going to be the variation on the number of photons that the camera registers in each pixel. And as you run it at higher ISO, you basically increase the electronic gain so that you need, it has higher sensitivity, but then there's more noise because physically you're just collecting fewer photons. What Sony has done in the most interesting new sensors, like the A7S, you can run it at like ISO 100,000, and it's meant specifically for low light applications that make bigger pixels. And then they have done an awful lot with the noise electronics to actually allow you to run much higher, uh, much higher ISOs than you could with film and much, no, much lower noise. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. So is there some rating, like say you're comparing cameras, it can be different qualities. It's like some are able to achieve higher ISOs without increasing the noise? Or so again, you, you can't increase your ISO. Every sensor still, no matter what sensor within that sensor, if you run it at a lower ISO, it'll still have lower noise. But what Sony has done is really worked on that for low light applications, and actually in particular for video, right? So you're showing all these shutter speeds here, but one thirtieth of a second, right, is 30 frames a second. So you can't have a shutter speed if you're taking video at much longer than that, or it's not going to be effective, right? Yeah. So what Sony did when they set the A7 asked was to make the pixels basically twice as big as a twice as, you know, the dimension is like twice the size, so they're much larger. So that each uh, individual pixel actually collects more photons yeah. over the same amount of time. That's one approach. And then just normal improvements in noise electronics and processing the signal that they can effectively have better images and much higher ISOs than they could even five years ago. So what he's saying is right, as about the Sony's, it's absolutely right. Like they've made an enormous amount of progress on their sensors. And in fact, the latest Nikons and Canons are starting to use more Sony sensors because Sony actually hived off their sensor division to sell to other people. So it basically just comes down to just signal noise ratio. Yeah, the but there's so many tricks people yeah. play with it now. You can't get around the physics of photography, but you develop other technologies to kind of make up the gaps. Um, okay, any questions here? All right, so as a photographer, when you're setting out to take a picture, these are the three things that you're going to work on as you're setting up and getting ready to click the, the, the show. Okay, so what's the science of photography, right? So the sensor is like a sponge. It needs X amount of light for, uh, you know, for it to soak up and make a decent picture. If you get too little of X, then the image is going to be underexposed. It's going to be dark. Um, if you get too much X, then things are going to be blown out. So things that were yellow, everything shows up white. So if you too much light, everything just turns white. Um, when we talk about images as from a scientific properties, we use the term image quality. So that can refer to the sharpness, dynamic range, what's the color depth, and the accuracy, and the contrast of the image. Uh, noise, which we just covered, and I'll show you examples of all these shortly. Um, and then other kind of lens-induced factors, right? So you have this concept of chromatic aberration where, you know, as the light's passing through this series of lenses, you know, it's basically going through like prisms, and every time it hits an edge, it blends, it splits, so by the time it winds up here, Chromatic aberration, especially when you have um, a high degree of contrast between something bright and something dark, you might get a, a purpley line or a red line or a green line, depending on what the lighting conditions are. So, you know, those aren't things that are there, but they become there because of this whole process. And so this is where you spend money on a, a lens from like Carl Zeiss because they've got special capabilities and things that they've developed to reduce chromatic aberration. Um, the nice thing is, is a lot of these things you can fix in software. So now it's important to understand, like, as a camera, what are my limitations, and you know, what am I good at, what am I bad at, and what can I make up the difference in, in software later. So that, again, changes how you look at a picture and what you're about to do. Uh, then the basic art of photography, like moving away from science, now you're talking about, you know, behind the lens, you know, what's the composition? How am I changing them? Am I zooming in? Am I zooming out? Am I using geometric lines to make it interesting? You know, what's the lighting, the negative space, the tension, motion? Are these are all the terminologies of, you know, when you go take a class that people talk about. Um, and you know, again, you can spend a lot of money on expensive equipment because they give artists another tool, right? Not everybody paints with the same brush. They use different tools, they experiment, and then they develop a technique, and that becomes their style. Same kind of thing for photography. Um, and then, of course, film versus digital. There's still that traditional battle of, you know, I like film and I like digital. And if you do a lot of, like, motion photography with streams and cars or anything that's, like, going through your frame, film still gives you a very analog, smooth action versus something that's digital that has a clock to it. You can see your image stepping through it. You know, if you look at it in detail, you'll see it's not a smooth passing. It's 
the stepping motion that goes through there. But if you can fix all that, it's all uh, So, you know, how do we judge that? Well, it's, it's art. So everybody has their own uh, opinion on good or bad photography. Okay, so this is the basics of pros and cons of each one of the, the major three um, controls that you're going to adjust. So aperture represents the, uh, you have basically like a, an opening at the back of the, This is not this is not an analog lens, so I can't show you the aperture directly. But basically, light comes in, and in the back there's this set of fins that basically opens and closes based on what the settings are. That lets either more light or less light through the lens. It has nothing to do with focusing or any of that. It's just more light or less light. So why not just leave it open all the time so I get as much light as possible? Well, as I'll show you here in a second. When you uh, open up the aperture, you reduce what's called the, uh, the depth of field. So what's in focus, what's out of focus, and how quickly does it transition from in to out of focus, that's affected by the aperture. Uh, shutter speed, if I'm trying to take a picture of a moving subject, <coughs> or sports, or you know, something else, having a slow shutter speed is no good because everything's going to look blurry. And having a faster shutter speed is important, but if I make a faster shutter speed, that's going to impact my other two options, right? And then ISO down here at the bottom, we already talked about image quality, right? So, you know, a slow ISO needs more light to basically fill the sponge. Fast needs less light, but, you know, as you move up the chain to these faster ISOs, you basically reduce your image quality by something. So, those are the, the basics, and this is what you got to think about. Am I taking a portrait of somebody and I want the nice blurry background, so, you know, it looks like a three-dimensional kind of a cool portrait? You want an open aperture. Well, if you know you want an open aperture, now you change the other two pieces of the formula to, to accommodate your lighting conditions. Okay, final thoughts on cameras. Um, you put the camera in auto mode, camera makes all the decisions on your behalf. It doesn't know that you want to do a portrait. It just knows I got a picture in front of me and my camera has 179 focus points and I'm gonna try and get the maximum focus out of all those points which means if I'm taking a picture of somebody that's in front of me, it's going to focus on everything that's in the background. So I've got a great picture of chairs and tables, but the image in front of me is out of focus. That's the normal problem you run into with an auto, auto mode. Um, then you have these uh, kind of these assisted auto modes, or you know, I'm going to put it in portrait mode or landscape mode. Now the camera has some general idea of oh, you're taking a portrait. Let me see if I can find two eyeballs and a nose and say, that's a face. Now I can focus on the face and disregard all the other focus points. So it's still auto, but you're kind of guiding it in the right direction. Then it has this thing called priority mode. So out of those big three topics, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, I can choose my priority as I want the best image quality, ISO 100. Now the camera's going to alternate the other two automatically based on the meter readings that it takes. If I want wide open aperture so that I get a nice blurry background or shallow depth of field, I pick a priority mode of aperture and change the aperture to the right setting. Now the camera alternates the other two to make sure that I get kind of a neutral light. Uh, full manual mode, which is where everybody should be, is you do it all by yourself. Um, and then I might already talked about the autofocus is not perfect, right? Um, most of the time when you take a picture, you, you deal with framing it first, right? I got my people sitting at a table. Wouldn't it be cool if I'm here and they're on the corner? I take the picture. Where is the camera going to get the focus from? Usually it's going to start right in the center. It's going to try to focus there. If you have it in one of these other modes, like an assistive mode to do a portrait, the camera may hunt for a face and then focus on that. But normally, the best way to focus a handheld point shoot is to get the center, hit it right at your target, focus it, and then so you basically hold the button halfway down. Everybody familiar with this? So you have the halfway down and the camera basically sets all the settings, and then you can move it and recompose the picture to make it interesting and then hit the button and click it. So it's like a two-step process. So just to highlight, you know, that's a very normal problem. Even with iPhones, they're be taking a great little quick pictures and putting them on. Everything's out of focus because it's focused on something other than what their subject is. 
Uh, and then just other basic thoughts that you run into once you start talking digital photography. Um, white balance. So the sponge that records the, the, the photo, it records as raw data, they call it, right? There's, there's electronics and photons and stuff that's stored inside the sensor. The minute your consumer grade cameras store that image, it converts it to a JPEG. The JPEG requires a bunch of fill in the blank variables, one of which is what white balance setting is it. So that the image that comes out reflects the lighting conditions that was in. Your, your brain has a natural tendency to know what white looks like, so when you go outside under sunlight and hold a piece of paper, it's white. You go inside to a, a room like this with incandescent lighting, it's still white. Your brain's adjusted, but the reality of the physics is it's a very different type of color. So that's what white balance does. Is it tries to correct the image for based on the lighting conditions. Um, normally you put the camera in auto white balance mode. But if you're outdoors, the camera will often think, oh, it's nice and sunny. But what you really want is kind of the cloud setting so that you get much warmer uh, colors out of your image. So outdoors, you almost, almost want to be in a, in a cloud white balance setting as opposed to sun. Then you go in the shade and you want something different. So, but if you're not paying attention to what the setting is, the last thing you want is for your picture to be orange because you were taking a picture at night with a bunch of city lighting and it turned out orange because you left it on cloudy setting. So, but that's what happens when, when your camera stores the image as a JPEG, fills in the blanks and now you're stuck with the image. If you store the image as raw, then you can convert it to a JPEG and change the white balance setting later. So almost all professional photographers shoot in what's called raw mode. And then if they accidentally went to a wedding and they had the wrong setting, you know, even with the shutter speed, the ISO, and the aperture, there's a lot of things you can kind of correct when you have the raw data. Disadvantage of the raw data is it's 10 times larger, right? It's, it's if I got a 25 megapixel camera, it's 25 megs worth of data for every picture. Yeah, but this is cheap. Huh? But they didn't used to be. Yeah. Next well, cameras that are coming out are 50 megapixel. And, you know, transferring a 25 meg through a cable or something else takes a lot of time. It's not as quick as a, you know, 4 meg. You know, JPEG compressed uh, 25 megapixel, I think it turns out to be like 6 megs. I always take the SD card out and just directly to the computer. Still takes time. So, anyway, but those are the trade offs. Um, I forget what the AEL button stands for, but basically that just locks in the light metering. So if I'm going to take a picture of a, of a bridge, but I want the shadows that are underneath the bridge kind of as part of the, the image, so I can point the camera under the bridge, hit the, you know, pretend like I'm getting ready to take the picture, hit the AEL button, it locks in the light settings, reposition, go somewhere else, focus the camera, change the setting, and then one last time in three steps, basically, compose the picture and then click the picture. So that's what the AEL buttons typically do. And then if you're using the light metering directly and you just want to compose the picture like straightforward, you know it needs to be brighter, there's usually a button with a plus minus on it. You punch that and then you right arrow or left arrow and just say overcompensate and forget what the camera meter says and give me more light or less light. Yeah, is that exposure compensation? What is it actually adjusting in the, in the camera? Is it adjusting the aperture? Uh, it's changing the meter. It's basically saying I want the meter to expect more light and then it goes back and adjusts the other three things. The ISO, the uh, aperture, and the shutter speed. And some cameras support, uh, I think, a capability called bracketing. So I can tell the, the formula, basically. I like my ISO between 100 and 800, and you can bracket that. And so now that when the formula goes and tries to auto-adjust, it won't go outside those boundaries. It'll make up the difference in one of the other two categories. So you can kind of bend the rules of just always like making you know, faster ISO, you can say, don't go over 800, use a slower shutter speed instead. Okay, uh, digital asset management. Real quick, it's simply, I go take pictures, and now I gotta get the pictures into my computer, and what do I do with my computer once they're there? You know, I've got over a decade's worth of stuff that I have to deal with now. It's not just a matter of I upload the pictures to Facebook and forget it. I want to manage it and go back to them when they're in. Uh, how do I tag them? How do I catalog them? You know, when somebody says, give me all the pictures of your kids, 
how quick can I get to those really cool pictures? Um, so I use a, a product called uh, Digicam. So this is open source, it's, it's uh, KDE based. Um, when I started fiddling with it, it looked and smelled a lot like Lightroom. And we'll talk about what, the, what that tool does in just a minute. Uh, somebody mentioned this other tool uh, the other day to me called Darktable. I don't have any practical experience. I don't know what the primary differences are. I'm assuming there's probably a, a, a contingency of people who said, oh, Digicam's not listening to my advice. I wish they'd do things different. And then out came Darktable as you know, different variants. <coughs> That's just speculation. I really don't know. Okay, and then basic workflow, right? You take the cat, you take the camera out, you set it up, you take pictures. You got to move the pictures off the camera. You got to insert it into your uh, digital asset management system. You're going to have some backups, I hope. And then at some point, you're either going to publish them or print them or do something with it, right? So that's the whole workflow that we're going to go through here. OK, so already talked mostly about how the camera image setup goes. Um, kind of talked briefly about you know, the, the advantages of why do you want to shoot in raw mode. Um, the other thing is, is very early on when camera companies started building digital SLRs, they realized like, hey, there's value to my raw format, and wouldn't it be cool that if I can dictate people that use my cameras have to use my tools, or I can charge the companies that build products that read my raw formats and stuff. So it became kind of a, it, it's nice, cool uh, capability to deal with raw, but it's also kind of a lock-in. So what Adobe did, uh, and this is from a conversation that I had with somebody else, so I'm, I'm hoping this is accurate. What Adobe did is they basically re re reverse engineered a lot of these raw formats and then created a raw, a open standard for raw formats so that as a photographer, whether I'm using a Canon, a Sony, or an Nikon, I plug it into my digital asset management system, it converts everything to this generic raw format, and then from that point forward, I know that I'm never going to get stuck with, you know, whenever Sony kills Canon and they go out of business because they haven't come out with any cool products. Um, I'm not stuck with a whole arsenal of, of raw files that are owned by Canon that's no longer around anymore, right? That's always the fear. Um, and that's been true for video photographers, right? A lot of people were uh, professional videographers and they invested in tools to do all their um, their video development, and then those companies go out of business, and now they're stuck with, their, there's no way to get their data back. It's stuck in this old system that hopefully still powers up and they can do something with it. So that's why this kind of came up. Um, for me, the Sony RAW format, I still haven't made the jump. I'm still shooting with JPEG. I want to go RAW. I know why I need to go RAW. I just haven't been able to do it primarily because I'm still using Linux. And I'm running RHEL 6 and RHEL 6 doesn't support the Sony RAW format. Um, but I'm also kind of unwilling to go compile tools and libraries and integrate that capability. It's out there. I could do it if I really dug into it, but I still have to use my laptop for work and I don't want to patch something and all of a sudden now my RPMs don't fit where they're supposed to be. So I'm waiting until I upgrade to, to RHEL 7. Um, and then the other key thing is about shooting in RAW is you get about two f-stops of freedom to correct things in post. So if I shoot things and they're too dark, having the raw data, I can artificially brighten the image without any loss or any gain of any additional information because the data's there and it's raw format. When you convert it to JPEG, you're fixed. You can still make things brighter and darker, but it's not like raw, it's completely different. Um, so if you know you're shooting in raw and you're in a dark area, and I know that I can kind of, you know, fudge an extra f-stop of light or shutter speed, and I'm doing like a, a concert, people playing instruments, I can deliberately shoot darker knowing that I can get a faster shutter speed and get a crisper picture out of it. If I know that in post, I can basically make it brighter and get the image back the way it needs to be. So again, something that affects your decision making while you take a picture. Uh, so then, the you know, other things that uh, deal with set up, you have color space choices. There's usually an option in there to set it to sRGB or some other vibrant color mode or whatever. Um, there's also noise reduction algorithms you can engage so that you can turn on the camera to reduce noise. But those have artifacts, right? So anytime you compress something or you do noise reduction, 
you might fix one thing, but you might introduce you know mosquito noise around people's hair or some other. So just got to be aware with what your camera's set up for. Everybody kind of familiar with HDR? So the camera's going to take three pictures, dark, medium, and bright, and then merge the three together to get something that's got a lot of depth to it. So, but it requires a steady hand because it's going to go click, 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 and then it'll merge the pictures together in the software. What's HDR stand for? Uh, high definition something? I mean, you're on the high, dynamic range. high dynamic range. Thank you. Oh. Uh, all right, and then cameras are just, you know, they're 20 menus deep now with all the options to do. So that's why I like doing things with manual mode. I've got three options and a handful of settings to do. Okay, so image offloading and storage. <coughs> I'm still using something called the Rapid Photo Downloader. Uh, Digicam has the same kind of capabilities, but um, essentially, right? My camera here actually has two SD slots in it, so I can put two cards in it. Um, I can tell it to store RAW on one card and store a JPEG on the other, and that might make you know the easy offloading so I can show people on the site what their photos look like, I can make it quick, and then I keep the RAW stuff for when I get back home. Um, but in any case, if I flip on the camera, actually let me steal the, uh, let's do this. So this guy has got the little port in here. I was, like I mentioned earlier, I was, uh, off below one of the bridges here earlier this evening. So when I plug it in, rapid fo photo loader, rapid photo downloader pops right up. And minimize this. This is what it looks like. This is everything that's on the SD card. Um, oh, wait, wait, is this a program now that's using on your computer? Or yes. Yeah, so the, in, in the case of RHEL, uh, this is available in a repo called Apple, the extended packages for enterprise Linux, um, which are Packages made by Fedora folks that fit onto Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So, but uh, for Ubuntu or any of the other distros, you just pull down the Rapid Photo Downloader. Um, rapid Photo Downloader is that built into built into the Linux program, or is that something that comes with the camera? That is a Linux program. It's an open source program. So you should find this in any of the uh, the traditional Linux repos. So one of the nice things that about this particular app is that um, if I pop open preferences, I can basically point the, the application like, okay, I'm going to store my photos over on this folder. And I can have all kinds of information in that path so that I can begin with, well, the, the root of the folder might have a year. So start with the year slash, uh, add the date of the product and then a little bit of text. So in this case, I'm adding a dot, and then metadata. So uh, the camera stores an enormous amount of information in the image itself <coughs> about the picture when it was taken. So like all the camera settings, all that information is stored in the picture itself. So I can use that information to somehow name the, the file itself or the path that it's going into to something unique. And so in my case, what I typically do, let me pull up my So I have a directory on my laptop here called My Stuff Personal Photos 2015. And then my syntax that I came up with is I create a folder that's based on the date that the picture was taken. So when Rapid Photo Downloader opens the picture, it basically extracts when was this photo taken. And then it also adds the model number of the camera that was used to take the picture. So I basically break things up into the camera that it came from, and the date that it was taken. So like my older Sony 580s, these are these Alpha 580s, you know, I gave those cameras to my kids to use that for all the classroom photography stuff. Um, although I, other than that, it's just a basic directory. There's nothing funky going on here. It's not going into a database or anything special like that. But Photo Downloader gives me a quick, normal, set up some rules, take the pictures off my camera, and, and sort them into folders. It's very cool. And then like I said, it's very flexible. So the metadata that you select, there's all kinds of options, you know, camera models, uh, the ISO settings, that we're doing, any of the, the 
you know, you can go by camera serial number. So if you have multiple cameras at the same model number, you can choose the serial number as, as kind of the, the sorting solution. Uh, okay. So in this particular example, I'm just going to grab like a handful of photos here. You can tip, you know, if you're unloading the camera on a regular basis, you just do a select all and hit go, and it'll skip every picture that it's already downloaded and just, you know, copy over the ones that are new. Let's just grab a couple here. I'll even select some from before and just okay to download these 39 photos. <coughs> and I've got uh, my Linux desktop configured so that the minute I plug in the SD card, it goes, oh, you must want to open this up with the rapid photo downloader and so it just launches right in. And then there's options inside of this to basically say, don't even ask me, just sync everything. Don't, don't pop up, and when you're done, say everything's fine. Don't make me hit OK. OK, so that's Rapid Photo Downloader. Um, Digicam has the same kind of capabilities. I've been using Rapid Photo Downloader for a while. Um, when I explored Digicam, I think there were not as many options for metadata choices and stuff like that. So some of the rules are a little bit different. I just haven't made the jump yet. I definitely don't want to have 20 tools to make my workflow work. It would be nice if I just had one. So, but I'm going to get there. Okay. So is Digicam, is that something also that comes with this all the same? Digicam, you'll find that and also in most of your traditional Linux repos. Yeah. And so. if I dare to ask, do any of these is it, um, come with Windows? Uh, so a lot of the KDE-based applications do work on Windows, and I uh, think there are distributions of uh, Digicam for Windows as well. John could probably look at it, do a quick supported platforms. Let's get rid of that. All right, let's go to. Where do you want to know if the camera's available on Windows? Yeah. So I just did a yum install Digicam, you know, with the Apple repo enabled and it pulled down. It's not going to be the latest version, but it's close enough and it works and it's stable. So and it XP, works. Vista. 7, 32 or 64 bit, and Windows 8, 32 or 64. Yeah. Alright, so this is the basic user interface for Digicam. Um, I, I've already created my, you know, I've added my, my catalogs to, um, to my albums. Um, Digicam works by setting up a MySQL database and then storing all the metadata about your photos in the database. It has an option, I haven't used it, to basically say, go, you know, if I change settings on the photo or I create metadata about the photo, store that metadata back into the photo as an XIF data. Um, but I'm more of a purist where I don't want to overwrite the originals now. When I get to RAW, I'll probably make that transition. So for now, I store everything in the database, and that's the only place where the pictures have data stored about them. Um, and so, like, it, Digicam creates a bunch of thumbnails, so it becomes very efficient for me to just kind of hunt through all my photos from the past year. You know, that's everything from 2015, and it's fast and responsive. And then uh, I'll show you in a second, you know, as I go in, I start creating tags on things. I can start to reduce all the photos that are shown to me based on the tags that I select. Um, what sure. is hmm? So that's the uh, that's the uh, the format that additional metadata gets written to the JPEG file. So the JPEG is not just picture data; it also has this additional metadata on the end. Is that the only metadata it does? Hmm? I know there's there's several other different uh, formats for metadata. Yeah. So if it's one of them, is uh, but EXIF, I think, is the one that's associated with JPEG images and other, I, again, don't know for sure. Well, I'm pretty sure it was both in the end. Huh? Yeah. And also the end of that. Don't, let's just pick it's a second. I don't remember the <laughs> tag in my library called blue. 
and I selected some photos that I wanted to kind of look at to kind of show you some things about photography. Right here's an example of, of shutter speed, right? I've got a, a slower shutter speed and can't, the train's moving so it looks blurry. So that's the artifact of choosing a slower shutter speed uh, over fast. Um, I can show you what that data looks like from the camera by clicking the tab over here, which is the metadata tab. Shows me I took this with my uh, A77 Mark II camera. Uh, it gives you some information about, you know, I had an F18, my focal length is a 35 millimeter. So all this information, that's the metadata that's stored inside the image. And every one of those fields is something I can use to essentially sort and store my images with uh, the rapid photo data. If you have that okay. GPS coordinates in it, would that be stored along with these kind of core yeah. photographic things? Just mm -hmm. similar. Yeah, so the, the A99, which is what I have here, has a built-in GPS. It will store all that data on the photo itself. Um, I think for some of the Canons and Nikons, it's like an add-on thing you stick on there. Or you can add the data later and just say, hey, where's my map? And I took these pictures there and just apply that to these 100 pictures. Um, here's an example of, uh, you know, in this case, I'm, I'm panning with the uh, with the train. So, not only is the train moving, but I'm kind of shooting with the train. And you can kind of see, right? If I zoomed in, it's still not perfect, but that's the, you know, that's how you get certain effects in camera as opposed to doing as a, you know, as a, a software-based filter. Um, and then here's kind of the same thing again. The train's moving at the same speed, but I took the picture with a faster shutter speed. And what I was thinking was called IPPC. I don't know that one. You have a tab for it. Where's that? You have a tab for it. There's a tab for it. Look at there. <laughs> Here's the XF data, and there's the IPC data. That stands for International Press Telecommunication Council. Well, wait, what's the difference between those two things? IPPC has a lot more different metadata types than uh, XF. XF is basically uh, uh, oriented on the uh, the physical details of the camera. And the IPTC is uh, has a whole bunch of things like uh, <coughs> copyright of the name, who actually took the photo. Or custom like, fields uh, kind of thing. Like uh, GPS coordinates of where the photo was taken. Hmm. And uh, a whole ton of things related to the workflow. So just real quick, two pictures taken side by side, or, you know, one after another. The only difference being I chose a different aperture. So this is a clear example of that depth of field, right? Bottle up fronts. This is what you do in a hotel room when you have a photography assignment. And I gotta like knock it out quick. So I get three bottles of water from the uh, concierge lounge. Set it up on the carpet. Um, so here's the, the aperture is more closed. So it's like, uh, let's go ahead and look at the data real quick. So here's like F32. It's about as close as this lens could get. And therefore, it, Pretty much in focus, in focus, everything looks kind of two-dimensional other than the fact that you know the bottles are kind of one behind each other. Um, and then going to the next one where I open up the aperture and now I'm at that f2.8 and things are going. And of course if I open up the aperture I gotta shorten up the shutter speed because the lighting's the same. I want to keep the light the same. So that's that's the you know why you choose a, a, a big aperture versus a little one. Um, okay. And I've got a whole sample of pictures of things that I edited, so we're going to get to the GIMP here in just a minute. And let's see, what else can we do with, uh, let's, let's talk about what happens when you adjust the workflow. I keep trying to use my pen on my touchpad, that's not good. Uh, I do have like an older style Wacom tablet. These things all work great with Linux. There's no reason why you don't want to use them. Uh, DreamWorks pays good money to, to you know, make sure that these drivers are up to date and, and, uh, and work with um, okay, Let me get rid of so the, the column here on the left just kind of changes the view, right? So I go back here with my albums. Here I can look just kind of more of a, a, a date categories, and here I can go by tags. I can go by timelines. So I can search and look for a grouping of pictures between a certain range of times. Uh, there's this thing called searching, and then there's this fuzzy search as well. And in fuzzy searching, you can you can um, have that you can go out and create fingerprints about your files. And if one picture gets close to another picture, it'll say, hey, these things look like duplicates. Do you want to delete one or the other to recover some space? It's actually a very cool tool. 
Um, so yeah, it looks for duplicates, and then you have the opportunity to kind of do some cleanup. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do, is I'm just going to scroll to the bottom for my folder of files that I got today. And so these are the these are the files that I, I didn't have to do anything special other than they got dumped in that directory. Digicam's already gone there, created some uh, thumbnails to work with. Perfect example of I just unpacked my camera and took a picture and went, oops, I need to go change all my settings. So then the second time around now, you know, I'm sitting at, this is the uh, Paul Revere Park right below the, uh, the bridge there. And, you know, just kind of fiddling around, the sun's going down, it's interesting. So start dialing up, right? The camera says this amount of light is perfectly good, but I want the image to be brighter, so I just kind of keep changing the settings around. And so what I'm going to do is basically kind of simulate what does a photographer do? I got a whole picture, set of pictures that I need to analyze. Uh, let's get rid of this stuff. Well, one of the cool aspects of this is I can quickly rate these pictures, basically, you know, give them stars, so that I can come back and identify which ones that I like and which ones that I not like. So this one up here, um, I actually have some uh, some tags that I created. So like this black picture. I'm going to go ahead and tag this one as delete so that when I go back later and sort the pictures that I've selected for deletion, I can come back and delete it. I could delete it here now as well, but I'm always hesitant to delete content before I'm really sure about it, especially if I haven't gotten back to my workstation at home. Um, okay, so this one's okay. Let's pretend I just flagged that one as okay, and this one's okay too. Um, these are all kind of the same. I like that one. The color is good. It's nice and bright. It's a little bit deeper. So now that I've kind of tagged the photos, I can come down here to the bottom and adjust my search parameters to say, only show me the pictures that I selected that are either free or better. And now you'll see that the selection is those four pictures that I picked, and then all the other noise is kind of pulled away. So from a workflow perspective, to drill down and go to the, like the 10 best pictures out of the 100 that you just finished taking, this is a, you know, a couple minutes spent finding the ones you want, and you come back to them and you're ready to go edit them. Um, so that's a neat aspect of this. Um, I definitely try to rate my photos as I go through them. I went to France this summer and came back with like, you know, close to 1,500 images and trying to come up with you know, 400 images to make a book is tough, so this system really helps out very well. Um, other things you can do, you know, if you've got two pictures, especially if you took the same picture twice, let's, like, let's look at these two pictures. These two pictures camera's in the same exact position, hasn't moved, it's just a light setting and maybe a focus setting that's different. Now I can do a right click and move this to what's called a light table. Uh, the light table is another application within Digicam that now allows me to compare these pictures side by side. If I have 10 pictures that are all the same with minor variations of settings or focus or whatever, now I can compare the one on the left and basically rapidly compare it to the other ones and narrow down which one's actually the best picture out of the set. Um, you can set these up, I haven't done this in a while, but you can set it up so that they're uh, synchronously managed, right? I can scroll around and go, well, I know the focus is better, or the color is better, so I can look at them really side by side. So this is another cool aspect of, of the light table. And this kind of mimics what, you know, model photographers that would do, is they get all the strips of film, and put it up the light table, come up there and look at it with their you know, microscope and say, that's the picture we're going to go with. That's what this process is supposed to mimic. Um, so again, this is part of Digicam. It's there. Nothing special you have to do for that. Um, okay, so let's pull up this photo. So, uh, other things you can do with, uh, you know, once you've got kind of your, your photos narrowed down, is I can select them and now inst uh, add them to what's called my batch queue. Right click. Oops. Nope, I just changed the the star rating and it fell below my value of things that I wanted to see. Let's add it back up here. Let's back up there. Okay. So we'll come up here and do a control A. Add this to my batch queue manager. So 
So the batch queue manager is a mechanism that allows me to take a collection of photos and apply the same adjustments to it, like a formula, right? So I've got my set of tools here to do uh, color balancing or color auto correction. Uh, I can, you know, I can crop photos, adjust the white balance settings. There's a bunch of tools, and and the way this process works is, uh, let's say I want to convert all to black and white. I can add this black and white convert plug in to my tools. Um, let's say I want to do some light sharpening to it. Uh, transform it. Let's say I want to resize it. So basically I can add all these things together and each one of these has um, some options here on the right hand side so I can change some of the you know, selections around what that filter is going to do. Um, more sharp, less sharp. Resizing it, like uh, I'm going to make it you know, like 800 pixels wide, whatever, kind of get everything to 800 by 600 start format. And then when I hit go, it just runs every picture to the same thing. So again, you know, for uh, a lot of professional photographers, when you go shoot a wedding and you realize when you come home that uh, I had my f-stop at the wrong place and everything's a little bit too dark, I can use a tool chain like this to basically adjust the next 100 pictures with the same, move everything up a little bit, make everything a little bit brighter. So that's purpose of this type of tooling and this is what this workflow is here to accommodate. Uh, if you do a, in something indoors, like in this particular room, you know, lighting's not going to change. So I can run around for an hour with a camera with the wrong settings on it and then not notice it until I get back. Well, if I shot in RAW, then I can recover a lot more information. If I shot it in JPEG, I can still make some minor adjustments to get something back. <coughs> So that's what this uh, batch queue manager is designed to do, is basically do something rapid and do it, you know, 10, 100 times in a row. Um, it's pretty convenient. Okay, and let's let me jump back to my presentation see if there's anything that I've missed so far. So we covered that. So my goal is I start, start editing some photos. But again, I went to France. Uh, fun photo technique is always to make a black and white photo, but leave color on your primary subject. It's actually really simple to do with GIMP, so I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, here's an image of you know, water with buildings and flowers. If you looked at the original, it's not this colorful. Uh, this image here was almost pitch black when it was taken, but I was able to pull a lot of the, the imaging back out. And then to kind of make it interesting, I made the majority of it black and white, and again, some color in the center. Uh, this is macro photography, so I took a picture of a tree frog with a macro lens. Um, but that's kind of what I'm going to go through with example-wise, is show you how to do that, and I'll show you how to do this, and we're also going to do this real quick. And we're going to do all this with the GIMP. Um, okay. I'll touch on real quick, basic backups. Always super important. A lot of great open source tools for managing backups of all your digital data. Uh, for me at home, I use a Linux server that's got a bunch of disks that have RAID configured for them. I'm using logical volume management. Um, I have mirrored disks so that everything's in duplicate. And yeah, my process still has problems because there's a lot of times when my SD card's almost full. I go, oh, I think I already downloaded everything home. I'll just reformat my card. And then I lose inevitably 10 pictures here and there. And I usually almost never notice until I want that picture. I'm like, God, I know I was there. Where'd it go? Um, and that actually happened to me recently when I photographed a kind of a special event for a uh, group of people. It's like happened to have my camera in the car and I took all the pictures and I'm like, hey, what happened to those pictures? Like, I don't know. Let me go look. And then, oh yeah, I format the camera on Saturday. So, future architecture. Uh, same base method, <coughs> but I'm going to switch over to using something called Gluster. <coughs> uh, Gluster is a software defined storage solution. So, if you're familiar with like an NFS server, Gluster provides NAS based storage through software. And the cool aspect of setting up something like Gluster is that I can run it at home, have an NFS server, and then I could stick another Gluster server into Amazon in the cloud and then set up relationships between home and cloud and basically have it synchronize and mirror data into two places. So now everything becomes automatic and I don't have to worry about unloading it and putting a duplicate. Once it's in Gluster, it goes, spans out all over the place. And Gluster is super scalable. You know, we're talking petabytes. If you're gonna have petabytes worth of data at home, it's a different set of challenges that we have to meet. 
but uh, you know that's what it's designed for. So you know you think you're you're, you're in a Netflix Pandora as they're using software-defined storage solutions like Gluster to basically answer how do I maintain libraries and catalogs of movies at massive scale. So works great for home use too. And uh, you guys familiar with Own Cloud? Heard that? So there's a solution for using Gluster as a backend for Own Cloud. So now you can get to your data anywhere because you have your own little cloud server at home, but use Gluster to copy it and stick it in another location. You know, run Gluster at home and run Gluster at your friend's house and then synchronize between the two. It doesn't have to be cloud based. Um, okay. So you're saying Gluster is up for backup only? Uh, no, you can use it for your primary storage as well. So, but you know, when I'm editing, I typically like to have SSD and fast storage locally here. Uh, but for storage and archival, having something like Gluster is a great solution. Um, okay. That was my quick blurb about uh, and printing and publishing will deal with some other time. All right. Let's do more Gimpy stuff. Everybody familiar with the GIMP? So the GIMP's probably the one of the oldest image manipulating tools in Linux. Uh, it has an enormous arsenal of plugins and capabilities to manipulate images. Um, but it's, what's the term? It's not uh, vector based, which is like some of the other tools. So it's not, it's not yeah, it's not, is it raster? Yeah. So it has its focus and for pictures, it's great. So let's pull this up. Let's uh, go look at this picture here. So I'm just going to right click here and say uh, open with GIMP. GIMP's going to fire up. Give me a different set of tools. All right, let me minimize this and give it a little bit. So the downside to me being on the overhead projector is my desktop has become super small. And that means that I've got to rescale this guy to fit between my toolboxes. My version of of, of uh, Rebel support that. So the, the newer versions of GIMP allow you to instead of having the tools spread into you know separate windows that float around, it basically integrates everything into a single window. Mm -hmm. I'm still using an older version. Uh, two point two point isn't two point six and two point eight. You're you're on two point eight. Yeah. So, okay. Um, you know what? So let's go edit an image that uh, I had kind of planned to do because I have a workflow that I want to walk through. All right, so did you where are you? All right, let's go back to my blue photos. So I'm going to try and mimic kind of how I got to that black and white photo. Typically the first thing I want to do is I'm going to rotate a picture so that's kind of square. Um, and I do that by pulling down a ruler from the margins. Which is not showing up. Why is it not showing up? Can't imagine this has anything to do with uh, being 
plugged into this monitor, but anybody know? Um, I'm supposed to be able to pull down like these snap lines, and they're not showing up. All right, so rotation tool. That's represented here. Click on this element, and it basically pops up the circle of where I'm rotating around. You can pick this and move it anywhere. So to, to particularly what I do, when I pull down the ruler, I'll get a dotted line that basically shows me a horizon right here. And so I'll pick one edge of the sidewalk, for example, drag the, the, uh, the center of my uh, rotation around to here, and then just go to the other end and just pull it even. Um, you know, we'll just eyeball it for now. And all right, it's also not giving me a preview. It's almost like somebody went in and changed all my settings. rotated my blank layer, sorry, let's try this again, rotate, that's why it wasn't showing. Okay, so we'll rotate it, make it look somewhat normal, we'll rotate. Um, the other thing is I'm also working with this file in a, in a huge size, so it's you know, 6,000 by 4,000, it's a 8 meg image or something, along with maybe 14 megs, so once I kind of crop it and size it down, something's more usable, um, <coughs> this will also run a little bit faster. So the next thing I'll do is I'll, I'll go ahead and crop it. So I can use the crop tool, which looks like the, the scalpel over here. Um, I typically like to do things in a 16 by 9 format. So if, if I know <coughs> which ratios I want to use, I can come over here and click on fixed, and then change the aspect ratio to 16 by 9. And now when I adjust the sides, it's fixed. Um, if you do any photography and you deal with uh, you know, framing and composition of your image, uh, general guides that you can use this thing called the rule of thirds and when you implement the rule of thirds you basically have what's called your hot spots which is where the lines intersect and the idea is to kind of fit you know important subject points or use the lines to kind of you know frame pieces of the photo that that, that are um, you know visually interesting and part of it um, and then you can also use this as an opportunity to like get rid of the uh, construction vehicle there so you know it doesn't have to be dead center but why not just get rid of the woman in a baby stroller there, pull this down a little bit more sidewalk. Seems to be good enough. All right, so now I've cropped this. Um, the image is still kind of large, so this is just my own personal preference. I'm going to scale this image to uh, 3712, scale it, and now I've got the, the base image of what we're going to do next. Um, other things we might want to do is uh, adjust the color. So just right click, you come down to colors. Uh, I do things typically by adjusting the levels. So it brings up the level tabs. And this kind of shows you a perspective with the histogram, like where are the color settings? Like if, if this was like a perfectly well-balanced photo where my white was white and my black was black, then I have a kind of an even distribution of color across the entire spectrum. But you can kind of tell already this is very dark. Um, the lovely thing is, is you can you know hit the auto button and go oh you know I'll let the computer decide what it needs to adjust and you know that's not awful since I'm going to go black and white in a few minutes anyway that's actually not too bad.
So I'm just going to go ahead and accept uh, you know, the, the, the default. If I want to change my mind, you can come back to reset, and then you can deal with like, okay, I'm going to make things darker. You know, I typically don't go more than like 10, 10 steps, and that's me because I'm colorblind. I'm, I'm very hesitant of adjusting stuff that my purples now turn pink or something, and I just can't see it. Um, brightness just kind of drives up the white, and then of course this is the middle numbers that just kind of adjust the colors in the center. Back to reset, hit auto. I'm just going to set that. Can yes. I take something that's too bright and make it darker? Um, so, same kind of step. So, let's just say this was the image and you think it's too bright. Uh, I can come in here and adjust the colors again with the levels. And then there's different editing tools, right? You can hit the thresholds, the curves. There's different tools to do it. This is just the one I'm most comfortable with. And where'd it go? Color. And you can also see that, you know, since the histogram originally had all my colors compressed kind of in one scale, they kind of spread them out. Now there's gaps in my color table, but that's the natural artifact of, you know, scaling things around. It's making up for data that wasn't there before. Um, if I'm going to make it darker, uh, typically what you want to do is just scale things from here, and then you can adjust, you know, make it darker this way. But the white's always going to be white. Um, there's other ways we can adjust as well to, to show you how to make things darker. And I'll show you that in a second when we do uh, layer masks and uh, some of these other effects to, to kind of boost color in certain ways. Okay, cancel that. Okay, so next step, uh, since we're gonna do this black and white trick, is I'm going to duplicate this layer. And I do that by just closing, by hitting this duplicate thing. And think of the layer, you know, just like a transparency, I've got multiple layers of the image. Right now, they're the identical images. But if I remove the one on top, I'm just going to hide this one, the image stays the same, right? Because this guy is, is not transparent, it's opaque, it's got the full image in there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this image and convert it to black and white. Um, there are plugins, like uh, if I go down to the FX Foundry, there's a whole set of plugins for photography. If I just take the menu, I can just break that out by itself. Um, there's effects to basically go black and white here. And it goes through a bunch of steps, I can show you what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Does that get better results than the accessory? No, they're just different. Right, so this black and white, you know, it also, you know, applies some uh, filters and some uh, some blurring effects to it to basically make it more like a traditional black and white and it blows out the, uh, the contrast of it, the bright and the dark. Not really what I was looking for. Um, Okay, so now I'm back to my original image. Let's get rid of that. And I'll get it out of there. Okay, so now we're going to basically, I got two layers. I'm going to work on the second layer and I'm going to convert this to black and white and I do this using the components channel mixer. And then here I can now adjust the monochrome or the black and white intensity of the various uh, color ranges. So it just so happens, I happen to know exactly which the settings are that a lot of other popular people use, which is 30, 59, and 11, and that gives a nice simple black and white conversion without all the drama, right? This just makes it a nice easy image. So here we have our black and white image. So now the aspect is, well, how do I bring the color back? Well, the color is still here in the original, but it's underneath my current layer. So what we're going to do is I'm going to right click on the layer and I'm going to add something called a layer mask. And the layer mask is essentially the, like, I'm, like a um, lottery ticket, I'm going to scratch away pieces of the layer. And then that's basically it's going to percolate through and allow the color, the color from the top. And so let's go ahead and zoom in on our subject of color here. Oops. So the thing is, is the layer mask is, is white, which means that it's fully opaque. There's nothing transparent here. Transparent here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my brush, with the black element, and one of the things that I've discovered with any photo software editing is hard edges become very visible. So I always use a tool that's got a soft edge to it, so like a fuzzy brush. If you do things with a hard edge, those never translate well, and when you do the final product, you get these weird lines in the doesn't look like a photograph anymore. Okay, so let's cancel that. Okay, 
cancel that. So now I've got my color selected. Um, GIMP also has a whole arsenal of shortcuts. Uh, the, the curly braces basically act as scale up and scale down my brush. So instead of having to constantly come over here and select a different brush size, I can just use the curly braces to scale up and scale down the, uh, the brush size. And so now since I've got my black paintbrush, I can just come over here and basically paint over where I want the color to kind of come back through. And you can kind of see how that has its effect, right? So that's not me painting it blue, that's me just kind of erasing the, uh, the layer that is the black and white layer and exposing the colored layer that's down below it. Right? So I'm not changing colors or anything, I'm just exposing the colored skin. What's that called again? So this is a layer mask. So I, I created it when I came over to my layer uh, dialog. I right clicked on this and said add layer mask. And then it basically said, well, do you want it to be white, which means hide everything, you know, if it's opaque, or do you want it to be black and basically allow everything through? And then when I come back with my pen, I basically color on the layer mask where I want the, uh, the stuff from below to come back out. Well, the biggest trick to this is uh, getting the proper edges. Uh, I found that there's a procedure, um, the procedure I found that works really well for that. Uh, it's called the uh, high path. High band, uh, yeah, I forgot the mathematical term. So basically, you know, the way it works is you take two uh, black and white layers, mm -hmm. and you do a Gaussian blur on one of them, and set the transparency to 50%, and burn it, and then uh, merge it back in with the, uh, with the other one. Yeah. And that keeps it very, very sharply delineated where the edges are. And that makes it really easy to uh, break the layer mask for that. True. So what, what, uh, what John's pointing out is that, you know, what I'm doing here, my subject's very narrow, right? I've got a person on a bicycle, and that's the only thing I'm focusing on. But if you have, like, a, a, a scene of something more complex, like a tree, right? It's got branches and leaves. It, this becomes a very obnoxious process to do by hand. There's plugins and, and, and formulas you can follow that basically says, you know, run these steps where you take the image, you run a filter on it, you run a different filter on it, and then when it comes back around, now you've got essentially a very black and white layer mask that now you insert that into this layer and then boom, your job's done. So, yeah. And what I described doesn't do it, doesn't uh, give you the entire layer mask what you want. Or it doesn't, it gives you very sharp definition of where the uh, border uh, the borders are. Like. It can still fill in the yep. with the light or black. Yeah. There's, there's countless YouTube right. things on how to do any of these. Yeah, it's, it's the only procedure I've ever found that gave me good results uh, of cutting on a person that would run hair. So, but that's basically how I created that, that particular image. You see, now, now I'm not drawing on a layer mask anymore. Now I'm drawing on the actual image. Yeah. Still doing hair. Now you're drawing on white, you said? So, this is what the layer mask actually winds up looking like. Yeah. Um, I can select to edit the layer mask, which is the norm. Once you create the layer mask, then you're essentially editing. So um, you see the layer mask is that white block over there. When I'm drawing and exposing the blue image, I'm actually drawing black stuff on the, the layer mask. And my buttons here are all different. Oh, I see. That's the, the sort of right. added stuff you added on you know, the previous step. Right. I forget. I Reprogram my my other uh, tablet that I have at home. I have the buttons in different positions. So I'm having to readjust here. So anyway, so that's how that's how the process works to kind of create that black and white effect with uh, with that particular image. All right. Okay. Any questions with that? That's pretty straightforward. Partial transparency, but yeah, you want to cut off something uh, behind a piece of glass and so on, the glass like if I can talk with it, you said maybe you could shut this one. I mean, you've got great things to All right, so let's go back to the photos and. <coughs> Okay, 
right. Let's go take a look at this guy. Um, here's the same kind of thing. Let's open this guy up again. One of the other cool aspects with the GIMP is that uh, pretty much everything you do gets stored in a, uh, a history, which you can very easily navigate and undo as needed. Um, and so, you know, layer paths, undo history, there's, there's a lot of tabs you can add to this extra dialog box. Um, the undo history is basically right here. So as I'm starting to apply effects to this, the undo history will, will grow, and then I can come back and quickly, you know, compare and contrast what happened before and after without having to undo all the work. Um, okay. So in this image, uh, what I did in the the final work is I basically added more light to the stuff up front to make the flowers look brighter, kind of dim down the back, and actually applied a. Um, a fuzziness filter at the back to kind of blur it out a little, a little bit more so. Um, but this is the image, you know, kind of as it came out of the camera. So, um, let's see, what's the quickest way to do this? Again, let's just do... So, I created a, a duplicate layer, it's the same thing again. Um, now what I'm going to do is create a, uh, just a, a general layer that's empty. You come over here and you set it as an overlay layer. And now, just like before, where I can have the overlay layer affect the layer below it, now I'm going to use the, uh, the blend tool to come over here and basically blend from color to transparent. And I'm going to change this tool from linear, you see it in a second, from bilinear. Um, you know, add some fake light to this to where it looks like, you know, the sun's shining on it. And so what the... Um, what the blend tool does, if we look at the layer by itself, right, I just drew a line. So, you know, I could draw, and the, because I selected bilinear, it basically goes from my point and then it starts to fade out from, from that center line. Um, let's undo these. And usually, you know, if you just go with full blown 100% opacity, it looks kind of obnoxious because it's way brighter and so traditionally what you would do is you would come up here and change the opacity for that layer to basically just make it something a little bit more natural. You can make it invisible. So go back and look and see what it looked like beforehand. And okay, that looks a little bit better. Um, the other thing to do, let's go ahead and do this again. I can also change this. Instead of being linear or bilinear, you can do what's called a, a shape uh, sphere mode, and now using the uh, kind of the, the lasso selection tool, this also gets kind of obnoxious because I'm doing it by hand. But as long as I stay within the bounds of the flowers, I kind of pick something along like this, and just kind of cruise along the border without going too far out of bounds. selected, it's just not showing it to me. Okay, so now I can come back to the <coughs> tool, and what the shaping tool does is allows me to basically select a range, and now it's going around the selection, and it's going to uh, do like a, a fuzzy uh, gradient blend. You'll see in a second what the results will look like, and then I'll take the filter away so you can see what the results are. Oh, and now I painted it white. Well, that's not exactly what I wanted either. And that's because I have it set to normal mode. If I set this over to overlay, I'll get the desired effect, which is just brighter flowers. And again, because you know, I kind of stayed within the border. It highlights certain aspects of them. It leaves them up in the shadows. So it kind of looks lighting-like. And again, I'm going to pull this back to not make it quite as bright and obnoxious. And so now you can kind of see beforehand, right? It was dark. <coughs> and now it's not so dark. So 
the last piece of this, which is, all right, I'm going to merge these two layers. So now I've taken those two uh, layers, I've merged it in, but it, since my I hid my original one, this one's still there. So there's the original, here's our updated image. Now the one thing I don't like is that we still have this arbitrary, kind of this bright spot that's a leftover from that first um, uh, bilinear uh, gradient that I did here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to my background copy, which is the, the new image, and I'm going to add a layer mask leave it at full opacity. And now what I'm going to do is the same thing as I did before, is basically kind of cut out the pieces that I don't want or I want to keep the background the way it was. This is kind of artificial. I'm just going to draw kind of a library line here. Ideally, I would follow the actual flow of the flowers and sit here and pencil in, zoom in, zoom out. Um, but just for the sake of example, I'm just going to speed up this process. So now, when I come in a... Still, oh, it's already got some stuff in there. Let's go fix this one. All right, so now I'll show the layer mask. All right, then. All right, I'm going to do this. Selection's not showing, but it's still there, right? Okay. I'm a little lost. Yep. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm explain it in just a second. Show it. All right. So the problem is, for one reason or another, I mentioned earlier that when I pull down things, I'm not seeing the the, the active selected zones. It might have something to do with why I'm, how I'm plugged in with this monitor. I'm not quite sure, but. Remember when I drew with the lasso and I kind of followed the path? Under normal circumstances, you would see this dotted line kind of circulating and, and showing the, the selection of the image that I have. As long as that selection is active, I can't work on things that are outside the selected area. So now what I just going to do is I just got to pick a tool to select any generic zone, maybe even do like a control A to select the entire thing. So I just picked a general space out here. Now, if I go back to my pen, I'm still working on the layer that has a, a layer mask. And all I want to do is kind of just draw a line around the flowers to kind of highlight the area that I want to cut out. And now you can see that that line in the, in the box kind of showed up the way that I expected it to, to. I can right click, show the layer mask, and now I'm basically just coming here and just either scribble everything out or use some other quick means to select this area and fill it with a, with a color. Let's see here. Fill the selection. Boom. All black. I did the hard part. And now I just want to do it away. Kind of finish this other spots off. So 
the net effect of doing this. Go back and unselect this here. Is that now that weird lighting when I enabled it? I had that big bright center beam that made the mineral. I've erased that piece of the photo. So now it just looks like the, 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 the flowers up front are all lit up, but I still have the old background the way it used to be. Okay, let's do one more thing to this photo. So I didn't really adjust any of the lighting in the background piece. It was all just around the flowers. So what I can do is I can go back to the original. Um, and what I wanted to do here was basically blur it out a little bit more. And so what I'm going to do is uh, just add a filter to this. So image. Oops. Sensitive here. My filters blur. The Gaussian blur is typically the best. 55. And so you can kind of get a sample of like that's what the original looks like. This is what I'm going to turn it into. I hit OK. And now the background's even blurrier. And you can see because I, you know, I wasn't all that accurate when I drew my layer mask here, where things are still kind of goofy. Like, right, everybody see that, this spot's right here, where it's not so blurry? Yeah. I can come back with my black thing and really get detailed to make sure I'm, I'm not missing anything. But this really highlights the flowers, makes it all pop up and frame nicely, you know, just, just another trick for, uh, for producing images. Okay. Oops. So could you have made the background sharper and blurred out the flowers? Yeah, absolutely. But in this particular case, the background wasn't sharp because the original image was of the flowers. So those, I was framing the flowers to have them be sharp with the blurred background. I can't correct that all that well. You know, the, the sharpness filter can only do so much. All right, let's get back to Digicam and do one more. Uh, by the way, is this Digicam program the same program that you actually da downloaded the images off the camera into your computer, or was there an intervening program? No, I, I used the rapid photo download. Oh, so you need to use the rapid photo, too. You don't have to, though. Digicam can do that. Uh -oh. So you can have the one tool do everything. So what was the advantage? Presumably there's an advantage to using both of them? I just used rapid photo downloader first, uh -huh. and I found that it had a little bit more flexibility in the rules for changing the naming, the file names, the paths based on metadata. Yeah. You know, because those are all pull downs. So it just depends on what the programmers decided to the pull down values that they're going to enable you to make decisions on. Okay. Um, get back to this. And then my temporary folder. Why am I missing? really start to act weird when you go to these lower resolutions. It won't let me unselect this, so that's not usually the case. There's a temporary uh, folder selected, so it's very important. Yeah, no, but the, the thing is, is that uh, Normally, I can like click on the uh, the rating down here at the bottom, and if it's at one, I can click on one and it'll unselect it and make it zero, mm -hmm. and it's not letting me do that. All right, so back to my categories. Blue says now it has all the photos in here. Okay, what I was going to do last was this is a fun one. Everybody familiar with the concept of tilt shift? Mm -hmm. No. So uh, there was a lens, so part of the artifact of, you know, I showed you earlier, um, aperture, right? The yep. things that are in focus and out of focus, when you take something that's like a landscape at a long distance and you apply that concept of in focus, out of focus, and you shift it a tad, basically, there used to be a mechanical lens called the tilt shift lens that did this mechanically. The artifact was it made everything look like a miniature model. 
So like, like a miniature what? Like a little miniature scale model, like uh, you know, two, two, you know, a little HO scale train or something like that. So you can take a picture of a city with a bunch of people walking with all their cars driving around, apply this tilt shift effect to it, and all of a sudden everything looks like it's this tiny, you know, tiny scale little models of everything. And that's because of the way your brain interpretates the interpretates the way your brain interprets, you know, what it's seeing. And so the, the artifact is that you start seeing things with this effect. Um, so I, you know, let's see, is this the original or just the one in my temp folder? Okay, so this is the original. Um, let me get rid of this here. And, you know, this wasn't really the design of, hey, let's use temp sh uh, a tilt shift effect to, to make this cool. But as I kind of started fiddling with it, it became interesting to me. Um, I'll show you what the final result looks like. Okay, so this is the final, let me go to the original. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull it up on the light table so you can see the two compared side by side. Okay, so the one on the This is the tilt shift. This is the unedited original. And so, uh, you know, besides just com kind of comparing the lighting, I use the same methods of setting up uh, an overlay uh, layer, and then just lightly kind of creating an S curve of, of the water, so it kind of has this flow to it. And I, I was just experimenting with it. Um, but then also, besides the fact that I cropped it off here at the bottom, I applied this tilt shift concept where. The, the fuzziness kind of starts here, it's more intense, it fades out, and then it, you know, in the background it picks up again. So you, know, you can kind of see up top, if you look at the shoreline, oh, yeah. this piece is in focus, but this stuff is way out, which is not natural, right? The, the picture, you'd never take a picture like that and go, oh yeah, I can see how, that, how he took that photo. It's really fake, but it forces your eyeballs to basically look at the subjects. So only if you study the picture do you kind of go like, hmm. But if you look at it for the first time at a distance, the, the, the fishermen almost look like, look like they're 3D. So let's talk about how that's done. All right, so I'm going to come back here to the original. I'm going to open this with GIMP. And we're going to rinse and repeat and do this whole process one more time. At least the quick version of it. How many megapixels is that image there? That star so, with? it is a, well, let's see, what was this? Um, it's 6,000 by 4,000, so this came off of, well, they're both 24 megapixels cameras, but yeah, so it's a 24 megapixel camera. <coughs> uh, and the, when it comes off camera as a JPEG, it's, I think, about 14 megs in size, so it's about half. Okay. So the basic idea behind tilt shifting is that uh, you got to kind of create this layer of out of focus to in focus, back to out of focus. And you do that by duplicating the image. So again, just created another layer of the image itself. I'm going to go ahead and come down to my filters and apply the Gaussian blur one more time. Uh, we'll leave it at 55, why not? And I should go ahead and uh, scale this down so it doesn't take forever to do it. Image, scale image, scale. This now should be able to operate and it's just a little bit faster. Okay, so blurry image on top, the original image down below. So now that what I need to do is create a layer mask. It's full opacity, so there's nothing coming through from the layer below it. Hit OK. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select uh, the black color. I'm going to use the gradient fill, the blend tool. And now basically to go back to bilinear. And now the trick is, well, what do I want the out of focus? I want it to be level. If I want to start with a level playing field, I'll show you, I'll show you what that looks like. If I hit the control button as I'm kind of drawing this out, it basically keeps the, uh, the angles at uh, increments of 15 degrees, I believe. Um, 
So if I'm going to keep it straight, I just leave it straight. And you can kind of see what happens here, right? Well, I think we've got to try again. All right, so let's look at the layer mask. You can see how the, what the, uh, the blend tool did, right? It just created a, a linear uh, blend from black to, you know, fuzzed out to up to where it's white. And the net effect is that uh, it, that's what it translates from the layer below and bubbles up. Now, the one, of the, one of the things about uh, right, uh, aperture and depth of field, if the guy's knees are in focus, his face is pretty much in the same plane. There's no reason why his face should be out of focus. So when you do an effect like this, you kind of have to account for things that are standing up straight and go back and bring the stuff that's linear back into, you know, if it's in the same plane, in the same focal plane, you have to bring it back. And so we just do that by editing the image with the pen. I leave black, and you can kind of kind of see, see right? I just kind of color over him, and that brings the layer that's in focus below back to the front. And of course, if you spend more time, you can be way more accurate at this. Oh, wait, so you're making an area back into focus that was out of focus, you're saying? Right, and I'm doing that because I'm coloring over. See, I'm coloring over the layer mask. Oh, see. So it's like making that area of the area mask ineffective. Right, that's exactly what it is. Um, same kind of thing. Like, see, he's a little bit further background, but yeah. you know, why not leave him in focus as well? So again, if I spend more time, I can be way more accurate at yeah. you know oh. dealing with this. But uh, you know, you can see kind of see already, right? Yeah. He looks way more three-dimensional yeah. there. It pops out that way. Um, same kind of thing for the trees, right, or the bushes up front. You know, why do these bushes, you know, leave these things as uh, colored? But the problem with this is now it starts to merge in with other stuff behind it. It becomes more difficult. So understanding that your desired effect is to have a tilt-shift style photograph, you got to consider when you take the picture, how much junk do you have that's incompatible with what you're trying to do. So, um, okay, so that's kind of how you did that effect. So you can kind of see that when you're editing with photos, there's a lot of creating layers, setting layers to this overlay mode, um, and then you can use uh, the you know just a, a, a white uh, blend tool to kind of add light. Like if I want to make this, um, let's do this real quick. Add another layer, set it to overlay. And same kind of thing that I did before with the blend tool. Um, although now I want to make things brighter using bilinear. Like, hey, let's, now they're in the sun, right? Now there's like beams of light coming through. So you can do that kind of stuff too. If that's too bright and obnoxious and makes it look fake, you know, take some of it back. Now it's almost almost invisible to the eye. Now to make it in the sun, what, what, what was the modality that was that called? Uh, all I did here was I added another layer. So I came here and just said create new layer. And then from here, you change this to overlay mode. And then I just use the blend tool to basically use the white color. And that just makes it better. And then I dial back. Uh, here. Oh, so you just added white? Yeah. Oh. Does all this affect the way it's print, uh, printing? If you want to print the image? Yes. So uh, once I'm done editing the image, and I save it back to a JPEG, and then I send that to the printer. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the way it comes out in the end. All right, and where where was this stream? The, the, the Where's picture? this stream? Yeah, it's in purple mass. Purple mass. Okay. Yeah. That's an awesome photo. That's the Mississippi River. Mississippi River. Okay. It's yeah, it runs right past my house, and like I've never been around. And all of a sudden, it's like there's guys in the river. I'm like, all right, let me go grab my camera. So, yeah, it was a fun picture. And I'm in the woods, I'm like stalking them through bushes. I kind of felt bad. It's like, I hope they don't see me. <laughs> okay. You know, it's sometimes what you got to do when you're doing well, stock fish, right? <laughs> well, it's not, it's yeah, probably well, catch and release. Also, the fish is not, any, it's not necessarily good, so <laughs> yeah. all's fair, right? Yeah. Well, because I'm not showing any faces, I, I don't think this requires any release as far as like traditional, you know, you, you can't identify who people are. 
just by their faces. So, I don't know. It's like that fuzzy line. I don't, if I were to publish this and become famous with it, I'm sure it'd be like, you owe me. But no. This is all just for fun. Oh, so you're saying there's an actual law that you can't? Yeah, there's. Uh, people or something? I'm not the one to quote. I can, you know, I can kind of tell you what I've seen on YouTube, and I believe, yeah, there are general laws that say I can't take your picture or go sell it without you having a release form, mm -hmm. or I can't take your picture and go sell it to a news service without having you sign the release form. Mm -hmm. you it, know. it depends, though, right? Because yeah. like if there's a crowd, or they, and, and a crowd of people, place, there's like, an assumption of how detailed and stuff like you know is the subject the individual. If he's part of a crowd, then it's all fair game. Yeah. It's, and it's mainly for models and things like that. Yeah, if you're right. really professional. That kind of work. And if you're a journalist, then that wouldn't be a problem either. Problem. Yeah, I think you have to be like in the, in the public eye in order for your picture to be fair game for anything. I don't think you can take people that are just free of anybody and just take a picture and then stick it in the newspaper. I don't know. Stanford has some good stuff, guidelines. Like you can, you know, take somebody's picture and then promote a product with that base and stuff like that. It's complicated. But the guys in the stream probably aren't. No. <laughs> They'll be like, hey, that, I think that's me. <laughs> anyway, um, if you're interested, I, I am on Flickr, all my stuff. It's, I still retain all my rights to my materials, but it's all up there if you want to follow it. But, uh, it's just Flickr slash door back, my last name. Uh, all my pictures from France. So Flickr gives you an option to what? Uh... I have a Flickr Pro account. I paid, I, back in the day when Flickr was still kind of new, I think I paid $25 a year. And then it gives me the option to kind of reserve a, a key name. So I I'm slash dual back. No, no, the question was uh, what license? Uh, you yes. have a choice of, of how you want to license it. Absolutely. Oh. So they make, the, they, they make the photos irritating to download. So if you try to download it, it'll give you a link to a, like a pixel as opposed to the picture. But you know, if you label all your photos as uh, LGPL, I think it's the public license for photography, then it makes everything easy to download for everybody. Otherwise, all Creative Commons is Creative Commons, right? That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. If you use say Spec Element in uh, Google Chrome, you know, it's very easy to get the uh, exactly. Yeah. The actual you just right click, and you get all these people are trying to block the right click. There's only three more clicks. Right, go to resources, frame, images, and then it, it shows up on your yeah. thing, it's there. That's right. It's pretty stupid. Uh, Cincinnati at uh, what, 6.30 in the morning, sunrise? That's kind of cool. So what are you doing for color calibration? Color blind, I don't know. I, I, I guesstimate. I pretty much assume the camera captures everything that, it, oh, you mean like color calibra calibration between monitor, yeah, camera, monitor camera to printer? printer? You're not doing anything. Okay. It's because it's not clear what tools work well in open source for that, right? There's lots of tools for Windows and Mac that you can take. Yeah. So I bought the Asus ProSumer monitors. You know, they're like 300 bucks. To, it's like a 24-inch monitor that comes pre-calibrated. Supports the uh, sRGB color space. That's what I have the camera set to. And then since I'm doing any of the printing, I usually use like a service like Blurb that usually comes out kind of washed out anyway. So. The better services that use better quality papers, they like, cost too much money for me to be kind of hobby. Right now. So I'll wait till I take a few more classes and learn how to read the histograms so that I can just do it all through science and not my own goals. So that gets into another topic I wanted to ask about, which is learning GIMP. Um, is there good documentation? Do you have to take classes? Uh, do you just. Well, I, I, I found that it was just. Uh, uh, I think YouTube. Uh, YouTube was, was one of them. It was, the other one was like a, uh, the uh, complete guide to GIMP. But what, I, what I'm doing is I'm doing um, like uh, uh, cartoons. Like um, uh, uh, I did a, uh, I, I hate the, the installation process for uh, for, 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 for Fedora. Mm -hmm. I absolutely hate it. I, it, got, it got so bad that uh, uh, I, I now use some, um, and now I'm now abandoned for and I use a, uh, 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 yeah, uh, We're gonna have to stop the video. We can't have the time. <laughs> this is just a case of um, well, well, uh, they could do better for 
Insulation. What is it that you don't like about the Fedora installer? Um, I don't like the fact that um, uh, 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 it kind of forces you to use the LVM, and I don't like LVM at all. Uh, I'd, rather have, uh, 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 I'd, rather, I'd rather have more control over, over the partitioning stage. Uh, and, 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 uh, and I, I can agree with that. I think the uh, the installer kind of took away a lot of the, yeah. the the guru controls to really get yeah, granular. Yeah, one thing was so what I did was I made, I made a picture of a, a a snake and it was swallowing a, a Dilbert and uh, I had Dil and the snake um, Nanaconda of course uh, 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 swallowing a Dilbert whole. Huh. Uh, and the one thing was I was, I was using the uh, the grid tools. And I was trying to uh, make it plausible. So the one thing was, is uh, I thought uh, 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 Gilbert was, uh, was uh, 180 centimeter, which made um, made the grid to like a foot, a foot high. And uh, I made this make it about 30 meters long. And uh, uh, so the one thing was, I was using. I, 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 I learned a lot. Learned a lot about Gil, about that. And the other one was, is um, uh, when they had the MBTA debacle. And he had the um, uh, 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 Beverly Scott left the middle, left the middle of the night, and I wanted her gone. I uh, I, I made a picture of her. Uh, I found a picture of um, uh, George Bush as a as a lame duck, and I, and I put I put her head on his body. Oh boy! <laughs> Did somebody mentioned. Yeah, the, the, the one thing was, was I thought the the guy at the game was a, was a, was a, He's a pretty good guy, and also... Uh, is, is, is the guy to give, the complete guy to give, is that, are we talking about physical book, or are we talking yes. about website? Yes, yes, yes. If, if you ask me, I think your best solution is to load the GIMP up, have a picture handy, kind of decide what you're trying to do, and Google that result, and you're going to get a YouTube video that's yeah. five minutes long, and it'll show you exact steps how to do yeah. it. Yeah, they, 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 they did have uh, the entire thing about the image mask, and... and uh, uh, in there and things like that. And, and I, I used YouTube videos and things like that. It has been around for so long, it's a lot of documentation. The difficulty I think I run into is the documentation is probably going to be outdated. You, you're either going to need a, a new version that's newer or a version that's older, so it's hard to find documentation that's always applicable to what the tool you're using. Versus the YouTube videos, which always seems to be very current. Yeah, YouTube videos are great if you already you know, basically know the gift and you want to learn uh, certain techniques. If you want a good tutorial to start out with, uh, there are two books I really like. The, one of them is pretty old. Uh, it was published in 2000. It's uh, Carrie Bunt's uh, Rocking Gimp. Uh, wait, could you repeat that? Rocking. 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 G-R-O-K-K-I-N-G. Yeah, okay. It's by Carrie Bunt. Yeah. That's like 15 years old now. Yeah, he so actually spoke here right. when he had that book. Oh. The, the second one, that just, uh, the second edition just came out a couple years ago, is uh, the, uh, the Artist's Guide to the Gimp. That's also very good. Yeah, that's the one I use. But uh, I, I normally go to the um, uh, YouTube videos first, and then the then one thing was I went, I went to something uh, particularly that explained uh, to me, I go to the um, uh, complete, uh, the artist kind of again. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have the um, uh, uh, images on my, um, on my toy server ready for you. To look at, you know, and after you're starting with Rocking the Gimp, after you finish, uh, finish the book and master what's in there, then go on to Artist Guide to the Gimp. And once you finish that one, then go on to all these two videos. All right, so just real quick, I know you guys got it front. So thanks for coming. I hope you found it useful. Yeah. Bye.